Hi, my name is Karen Ziegler and I help enterprise leaders cultivate the creative potential of their employees to innovate the future of how their companies work. And I do that through design thinking, training, and consulting. In yesterday's video, I talked about innovation is a marathon and I related the aspects of a marathon to the race being the marketplace, you know, the tools we use, shoes and bikes or whatever being our products and services. And actually, the runner in the race of a marathon is the organization as a whole, our employees, our systems, our processes. And so I want to talk specifically about the employees today because I, I believe that uh, they are the engine of the in innovation for the future. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But the purpose of this video is to talk about you know, six ways that leaders can fan the flames of creativity in their employees. And so, you know, what has that got to do with design thinking? Well, according to Gartner Research, uh, C-suite skills are witnessing the greatest demand in design thinking. Why is it that C-suite leaders like yourself and leaders all across the board are seeking design thinking skills? Well, the one word of that is creativity. Um, Creativity is the future. According to the World Economic Forum, um, it is the key to success in the future. And in fact, many AI advocates, artificial intelligence advocates, says that it will be the only jobs that remain in the future, that systems and machines can do everything but the creative work. So it's crucial for leaders to... Um, develop these skills and the reason why they're turning out in record numbers to learn design thinking according to Gartner's research it's up 174 percent is that design thinking is one of the most documented and most successful ways of um, being creative or creative problem solving and so being a leader it's not only important that you develop your own creativity but you have to determine how it is you develop the creativity of your team as well because you won't be a leader if you don't have people to lead. And the leaders that are going to be most successful in the future are not only creative in their own rights, but they're also um, really good at developing the creative skills of their employees. And so that's what this video is about today. How do you develop those creative skills in your employees? And when we recap this at the end of the um the video, I will, I'll bring all this back together. You know, these are six individual tips that you can take, you can apply to yourself, you can apply to your employees, but why is it that design thinking taps into all of these? And then we'll wrap up the discussion with that, but let's get started on six ways leaders can fan the flames of creativity in the Okay, here we are. Tip, tip number one for fanning the flame of creativity in your employees and that is to craft employee jobs to utilize their strengths as much as possible now most of us in organizations have uh, that have been around a while have heard of Gallup's uh, strength finders test and most of us have taken that test and looked at it and and uh, loved seeing the cool things about ourselves that make us who we are but a lot of times leaders have not looked at those tests through the lens of creativity and how they can use those strengths to create what they need. Let me just give you an example. My number one strength is strategic, which reading straight from Gallup's website, this is what it says. Um, people exceptionally talented in the strategic theme create alternative ways to proceed. Now, obviously my description uses the term create, um, but if you have someone that's gifted in strategic um, theme or strength, then they create alternate paths. So, you know, when, and they have a need to do that. That is an innate need of mine to help people solve their problems or help them to find a what, another way to accomplish their goals. Um, and so my need to be strategic the one that fuels and fills my soul is oftentimes a company's need 
to have a problem solved. And that's the way it is with every strength. And it's those bringing those two needs together that spark the creativity and, and uh, fan the flame of creativity. Because when I have my need to be strategic and you have your need to have an alternative uh, solution to meeting a goal, then boom, we can be creative together. Same thing. It's not as obvious with every strength, but let me read you another one. This one certainly is not one of mine. Um, and in fact, we probably drive each other nuts. But uh, let's look at another theme, uh, the one of consistency. It says ex people exceptionally talented in the consistency theme are keenly aware of the need to treat people the same. They crave stable uh, routines, clear rules, and procedures that everyone can follow. Now, obviously, innovators by nature are rule breakers, but there are many instances in organizations where you need stable routines, you need clear rules, um, you need procedures that everyone can follow. And so when you tap into the need to d create those environments in the employee, married with the, the problem that the organization has or that you as the leader of the team have, then boom, you've sparked creativity. So see, it's interesting that what the employee needs and what the leader or the company needs really aren't opposing factors. They're actually that when the two come together, then creativity sparks. And so I want to encourage you as a leader to go back, maybe dust off your strengths finders uh, results and the results of your employees and look at their strengths through the lens of creativity. And when you look at that, think about the problems that you're working on or the areas of your uh, business or your performance that need a little creativity. Who on your team is most suited to bring the need that they have in their own lives with the need that you have as a leader? And it's there that the collaboration really gets fun and exciting for both of you. So on to tip. Tip number two, leaders who fan the flames of creativity help their employees create space. Um, and what I mean by that is downtime, uh, times of rest, times where they're not 100% excuse my uh, French balls to the walls. Um, and I won't talk a lot about this because I have a video called 2021 Goals When Innovation and Self-Care Align, which talks about seven reasons why self-care improves innovation. So I'll share that link in the comments below. But just know that it's important that your employees have space uh, to explore creativity. Creativity is a process of the right side of the brain versus the logical left side of the brain. And so we have to have a space in our calendars, in our day, and even in our work where um, you know our logical brain is just not churning out uh, things for us to do. So you know, find a way to help your employees, you know, reduce multi multitasking, you know, reduce, um, you know, their influ the influence of technology. Um, perhaps they've been grinding on a project for a long time uh, today and you can sense that their energy levels are getting low, you know, encourage them to go out and take a walk for 10 minutes. Uh, look for ways, whether they're big or small, to encourage your employees to uh, add some space uh, to their day and between them and their work because it's in that space and that stillness in that quiet space that our right brain can uh, kick in and provide us the inspiration that we need for creativity. But I hope you'll check out that uh, video for innovation and self-care and how they align. But on to step number three or tip number three. Tip number three of how leaders help fan the flame of creativity for their employees and that is they allow cre uh, failure. In fact they often applaud failure because it means that the employee had the courage to try. You know we all come with innate gifts and talents but unfortunately they do not arrive fully developed and it is our willingness to get out there and put our creativity out there and work on them that allows them to flourish. In fact, even though I may have the skill of uh, being strategic, um, that skill did not come fully developed. 
And believe me, life has thrown me many opportunities to develop that skill, many of which don't necessarily show up on a resume, but it has honed that skill over time because it has a purpose and the purpose that I bring to the world. And the same is true for every uh, talent and gift that your employee has. You know, they may bomb out at something they try, but if it is, in fact, one of their skills or talents um, based on their strengths or personality or any of those variables that uh, teach us about ourselves, then they will begin to develop over time and hone into how they use that most effectively. And it is in our allowing failure in that way that we can fan the flames of creativity. In fact, I don't know if you know who Sarah Blakely is, the CEO of Spanx, but I just loved her story of how every night at the dinner table, her daddy, her daddy would ask her how she failed today. And that was just one of his ways to fan the flame of creativity in his children and to let them know that they shouldn't quit, that sh they should keep going because it's through the efforts of trying again and again and again that we land on the way that is most successful for each of us to bring our creativity and our gifts and talents to the world. So as a, an effective leader, you want to fan the flames of creativity. You want to allow your employees to fail and applaud them whenever possible. Now, of course, we can't applaud them for losing the company money or losing important customers, but most of the time, uh, things are not of that magnitude. So, on to tip number four. Tip number four for flanning, fanning, the fl flanning, bleh, fanning the flames of creativity, and that is uh, leaders that fan the flames of creativity effectively use constraints. Uh, a common misconception is that constraints um, constrain creativity, but the truth of the matter is actually constraints bring out creativity. You know, in my earlier management days when I was uh, managing frontline employees, uh, we had no budget, no uh, ability to change systems, you know, no ability to do a lot of things, yet those constraints did not stop us from finding a way to reach our goals. And so that is um, key for leaders to understand. Constraints do not prohibit creativity. Cre constraints actually, in fact, um, enable creativity or they help creativity. Because, I mean, think about anything that you've ever achieved. A lot of times the greatest motivation is for someone said that's impossible or you can't do that because that's when they really get to work to prove that they can do that. So it, it can really be a motivating factor. But the key for leaders is to understand that you need to be firm on the what but open on the how. So for instance, back when I was managing a frontline team, I was firm on the what, the goals that we had for the team, but I was very flexible on the how and open to the how. I can still remember to this day when I first arrived at a branch that I had to turn around because they were performing low that, you know, I was working with my team going through the design thinking process, you know, of, of defining the problem and uh, well, first casting the vision, then defining the problem, then prototyping different ways to solve the problems and, and to reach the vision that uh, I was talking with an associate one day and we were talking about how we were going to change a process that allowed us to do it better and make it faster or less convenient, you know, inter take away interruptions from the customer and a number of other things. And she said to me, well, but what if it fails? And so this kind of goes back to the failure one I just shared with you. I said, that's not an issue. We'll just try something new. So it's very important that, you know, employees know up front that, you know, this, it doesn't, it's not going to be a big deal. If this particular method route does not um, play out the way we want it to, we'll try something different. And so that's where, where this comes in, that ability to use constraints effectively. Be firm on the what, but flexible and open to how it happens. And that's when you allow your employees' creativity to flourish. So on to tip number five. 
Point number five, how leaders help fan the flames of creativity. And this actually is very similar to one I spoke about earlier when I talked about strengths and looking at your employees' strengths as a source of uncovering where their creativity lies. And actually, I guess you can apply this to anything, any assessment type tool that helps you become more self-aware. So in this example, point number five, um, leaders use their personality types to discover their creativity. And, and I won't make another point of this, but you could also use your values, uh, indicators, and any other self-assessment tool. But let's just look real quick at uh, some examples. And this information actually you can find right on the uh, websites, uh, I mean on the internet, um, particularly with Myers-Briggs. Here's, here's a little idea for you as to how to uncover the creativity of your employee and fan the flames using the Myers-Briggs personality. So, for instance, um, those with Myers-Briggs that have the SP personality type, which is sensor, and I forget what the P stands for, but anyway, it's the ESTPs, the ISTPs, the ESFPs, and the ISFPs. They're known as the artisans, which obviously that is a creative person. So creativity for artisans, but it doesn't only include art or crafts forms. It also could be about experiences. So I mean, everyone knows user experience is all the rage. Who in your group of or team is one of these personality types, the S, the S or the P? Because the S's and the P's are very good at creating experiences. And so that's just one example. The Guardians um, are the SJ personality type, ESTJ, the ISTJ, the ESFJ, and the ESFJ. So they are usually considered the least likely to be creative because they are called the Guardians and they're the keeper of the status quo. So they t tend to like to hang on to things in their lives, um, traditions, and so forth. But... It says, while they tend not to be as creative, they show tremendous resourcefulness in creating new iterations of long-standing traditions. For example, things like planning and executing a Veterans Day honor event or, you know, some type of awards dinner. So um, perhaps there's, and even if you think about this, you know, I saw something about innovations and how the big pen hasn't changed in decades and decades. Um, but the marketer for the big pen has to, you know, take on that tradition of the big pen and recreate why it's so important. And so uh, that's another way you can look at the personality type to uh, tap into their creativity. One more just to share before we go on to the next point. The idealists, and they're the NF people. ENFJ, INFJ, ENFP, and INFP. These create creativities for idealists include writing books, poetry, lessons, plans for the idealists. The real world is the starting point. So they need to start, you know, in what's going on today. They're not going to be deep in their imagination, but the, then they're going to, these are the people that make the great writers, educators, mediators. So again, hidden in the personality type is secrets to the creativity that you can fan the flame of. And that goes for strengths, as we've already mentioned. It goes for the personality types, whether it's the Myers-Briggs, the Enneagram, the DISC, whichever one you want to look at, um, and values. Any self-assessment that's going to make you more self-aware of what uh, it is you're made up of, who, you, who it is you are, will give leaders an insight into how they can tap into the, that individual employee's creativity and fan the flame. So now on to point six. And our last point, point six, how do we fan the flame of creativity or in our employees? And I think this is a universal leadership trait. No matter what it is that you are trying to uh, cultivate in your employee, you can do that by modeling it. So point number, tip number six is model creativity. And I would say, um, because creativity and being really vulnerable 
about uh, showing up to be creative is, is new for a lot of people, it's important that you share that vulnerability. You know, you share uh, where you're nervous about sharing an idea, where you're nervous about, um, you know, launching an idea. You know, be vulnerable about, vulnerable about, you know, your level of experience with creativity, how it makes you feel to show up in the world as a creative. You know, whatever the case may be, if you have a feeling about it, and if you're doing things uh, for the first time or, or figuring things out for yourself as a leader, share that with your employees because the more they see you getting uncomfortable to be creative, the more they are going to be willing to be uncomfortable to be creative. So that wraps up our six tips for fanning the flames of employee creativity. We'll wrap this video up and tell you how de design thinking, especially using design thinking as a leadership principle or an, as an innovative leadership principle, really allows you to tap into all of this for your employees and your team. Now that you have cultivated the creative potential of yourself and your employees, how do you begin to herd all these creative bunnies together? And I call them creative bunnies because one, I wrote a post, uh, How to Walk Your Bunnies, a, a video actually, which I'll share in the comments below, but bunnies are the most creative creature on the planet. They create up to 84 bunnies in a year, and just imagine if your employees could be responsible for 84 innovative ideas uh, and improvements in your organization and in the service that you bring to your customers. What a difference that would make. But how do you begin, once you've cultivated this creativity in your employees, how do you begin to herd creatives? Because I don't know if you've ever worked with creatives. Uh, it's not the logical brain. So it, for those that are new to it, it seems like things are all over the place and it seems a little chaotic. But So how do you begin to rein in the chaos and herd the bunnies? in a specific direction to accomplish a specific goal. And that's where design thinking comes in. Design thinking is the tool for, and the process for taking a group of collaborative individuals together to move towards a goal. And now whatever that, that vision is gonna be different depending on your level of leadership. You know, for the frontline leader, it just may be how do I herd these creatives to reach our performance goals or whatever the metrics may be. You know, for a small business leader, it could be, how do I herd this team of mine to innovate the products and services that we have to, you know, uh, adapt to the changing world? Uh, on a large scale, it could be something as um, significant or massive as a change management initiative. How do I uh, harness the creativity of my employees to create the, create the change that I know our organization needs to make? So... Uh, the goal really is um, can be any anything uh, actually. That's the beauty of design thinking. It's a creative process that allows us to work towards any goal. And so, in this last bit of the video, I want to kind of I won't go through every step of the process, but I kind of want to show you how the tips that I've just outlined on cultivating co creativity really are contained in the design thinking. But think of it this way, design thinking is the conduit for the creativity that you've cultivated. So if you were an archer and you were aiming for a target, you know, your target's going to be your goal, like I just gave you three examples. And the arrow is, you know, you're, you leading your employees towards that goal. But the force that gets them there is the design thinking. And so... There are five steps to design thinking. Empathy, defining the problem, prototyping, oops, <laughs> ideation, prototyping, and testing. And so just to kind of give you a few examples of how that works. When you think about tips, I believe it was tips one and four, the ones that dealt with personality and strengths. Empathy is not necessarily about feelings, though they are very important. Feelings are an energy that block uh, our ability to connect with our employees and to really discover what their needs are because quite frankly if they can't trust you with their feelings they're not going to trust you with their needs so empathy really is more more than 
understanding their feelings because quite frankly, I don't know if you are married or have a partner, but uh, understanding another person's feeling is very complicated and half the time we get it wrong. So it's not about understanding their feelings. Uh, certainly it's holding space for their feelings, but what it's truly about is understanding the needs behind the feelings. And as you can see with the discussion on the personality and the strengths, each human in your care as a leader has needs. Needs to express their creativity. Um, needs to express who they are, to be 100% authentic and real. And so that's a, a beautiful part of design thinking that it allows employees to work with their leaders to express their needs in relation to the vision that they're going after the goal. So, you know, for performance, for instance, uh, an employee may have a need for further training or they may have a need for, you know, concentrated work where they're away from the customers for a period of time. You know, it's, it's getting beyond their feelings to what are the needs that they have in order to move forward. And so, uh, it's a beautiful thing in the empathy phase when you begin to learn about your employees, what they see as obstacles, what they see as not an obstacle, because um, often we're not on the same page with them if we don't begin to have those conversations about what's working, what's not working, and how can we make it better as it relates to the goal that we have. And so that's a, one of the ways. Uh, defining the problem is the second thing because you know, if you have a team of 7, 10, even 25 people, their th thoughts on what the problem is versus what maybe the consensus thought of what the problem is could be a different thing. And so you have to define the problem that you're going to solve because quite frankly, when I was a frontline manager originally using design thinking, there were a lot of problems that we could not solve. You know, we couldn't solve the frustrations we had with our system, which was you know, a nationwide system. We couldn't uh, solve frustrations we had with a particular product because we weren't part of that system. We had to, there were things that we had to deal with. So we defined the problem in a consensus way as to what mattered most and what we had the power to change in that scenario that we were working on, which was performance at the time. And so it's, it's not just in defining the problem, but it's also in setting the vision because you want employees focused on the visions, not on the problems. Because I don't know if you've ever chased problems, but they tend to lead to more problems. And they tend to lead on a path not necessarily in the direction of the vision you have going. So how do we get going in that direction and begin to resolve the problems that are standing in our way of going in that direction? So defining the problem. The next part is ideation. And ideation is way different than brainstorming in that you have the resources of the organization and the people at hand and the problems that need to be solved and where do those meet? Where do those connect that you can begin to solve the problems with what you have? And that's where constraints come in, which we talked about briefly. You know, prototyping is awesome because when I uh, worked with a team <clears throat> as a manager, you know, one of the things that's great about tapping into their personalities and the strengths is, okay, this is what we see as the solution to that problem. What part do you want to play in that? And then they get to tap into what excites them, what is it they want to stretch themselves for, rather than pushing down, you got to do this and this and this, allow them to take part in the way that excites them. That's how you get people happy and excited and enthusiastic about their job. It doesn't mean that there's still not things that they might not want to do or that may not be their strengths, but their first choice should be of this solution that we're coming up with. <clears throat> excuse me. What part do you want to play? What is it you want to do? You know, if it's training that's prohibiting performance, maybe they want to train on a particular product that re they're really good at or um, perhaps it's, you know, rearranging the, the showroom to better, you know, flow for customers. And lastly, testing. You know, testing is uh, thought of as the final piece to design thinking, but actually it doesn't always turn out to be the final piece. Sometimes we end up going looping back into the ideation, prototyping, and testing, and that loop just continues to happen 
until we come to a solution that uh, achieves the vision that we have. And that's how leaders as well as the employees begin to learn that failure is not fatal and failure is not final. There is opportunities to try again, to tweak things, to make adjustments, to perhaps you discover that there's something more important than the solution, the problem that you're trying to solve. But testing is, is the last of the process, but not always the final step in the process. So there uh, you have it. How design thinking is the conduit for creativity and using that to achieve your company goals. And I hope you found this uh, video useful. Um, if you did, please like it and share it with your colleagues. Comment below any additional thoughts you have if you've practiced design thinking or used it with your team. I'd appreciate your feedback and your input. I'm sure our viewers would as well. And don't forget to connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks so much and have a great day.